Hey guys, in this video we'll hopefully get this battery working again. If you remember from the last video, this battery was failed. It was not taking a charge, it was reading 7 volts. So we took it apart to identify the problem. Today we have a new BMS, we're going to put a new BMS in, charge this back up, and do a capacity test to see where we stand and make sure it still functions properly. So a lot of you guys had suggested removing these three cells that were undervolted and replacing them. There was also quite a few suggestions of breaking these all apart and forming a 4S2P, which was a great idea as well. The problem is just there's no way to connect these aluminum strips here. A couple people said to spot weld them. You can't spot weld to aluminum, at least not with the spot welder I have and not with what most people are using. I'm just going to put this back the way it was with these same three cells in here and we're going to do a capacity test and see where it stands. But before we do that, a few people did want to know the internal resistance of these cells. Now of course the idea is to measure an individual cell and these cells are in blocks of three. So this won't be the best test but this will give us an idea comparing the four groupings together. So the grouping that was undervolted is reading 0.17 milliohms. We have 0.13 milliohms, 0.1 milliohms, and 0.07 milliohms. So they're fairly close, they're kind of all over the board, they're not perfectly matched, but they're close enough. Alright, this is the BMS I selected as the replacement for this battery. This is a 100 amp 4S lithium iron phosphate BMS. It's got a pair of 10 gauge silicone wires with 200 degree insulation for both the B- and this is a common port version, which means there is only one set of leads for both charging and discharging through. This also has a temperature sensor, which is great, so this will have a low temperature disconnect to prevent charging your battery below freezing and permanently damaging it. And then it also comes with a fairly lengthy balance lead. I paid about $80 for this BMS shipped. I purchased it from Battery Hookup. I'll leave a link in the description of this video where you can purchase one if you're interested, along with the coupon code for 5% off. So the battery's put back in this enclosure here, and we have this little bracket that kind of goes across. And this is where the old BMS was situated. Now unfortunately this new one does not have any mounting holes. So what I think I'm going to do is attach it to this piece of metal here, probably with a piece of double-sided tape, and then I'll also put a tie wrap around it to hold it since I don't want to rely solely on that tape, and that will allow me to have the battery leads reach the battery terminal over here, and I'll also have enough room to reach the negative terminal of the battery case with the other leads. Now, these are the same type of connector here, the one that came with the BMS and the one that's original in the battery. But if you look at them side by side here, you'll see the polarities are different. So on the BMS connector, the negative is the leftmost pin, and on the connector that's on the battery, the negative is the rightmost pin. So what I'm actually going to do is I want to cut this lead about halfway back, and I'm going to reuse this connector, but I'm also going to splice on this connector. That will allow me to plug this one into the BMS, and then I can connect a separate cell level display into this connector so I can see for myself what is going on in the battery. All right, so here's what I did with the BMS wiring. Like I said, I have two connectors now, and I did try to reuse the old connector, but uh, I tried to move some of these wires around, and these pins just like break off very easily. Um, so I ended up having to sacrifice this connector, which is fine, because the quality of this connector fits the quality of this battery. So before I can use either one of these connectors, I need to make sure I have the pins in the correct orientations. If you don't, you risk blowing up your BMS and then you have to buy a new one. So to do that, I'll take my multimeter and I'll put one leg on the negative terminal of the battery pack. And I should be able to go up each pin and see the voltage increase. So the first pin is zero volts because it's the same as a negative pin. The second pin is three volts. The third pin is six volts. The fourth pin is nine volts and the fifth pin is 12 volts. So now I know these wires are in the correct order and I should be able to plug in my little BATGO display here. All right, and here we can see the voltage of each cell grouping and we have a voltage differential of 124 millivolts between the high and the low cell. So before I can put this BMS in the battery enclosure, I need to crimp a lug on the end of these two wires. 
And to do that, I'll use this open barrel uh, 100 amp ring terminal. So I've got this, uh, this is a recent crimp tool I ordered. It's an IWS, uh, IWS 5100A, and it goes up to 100 amp open barrel ring terminals. So I'm just going to insert this ring terminal into the largest crimping slot on this crimp tool. Now you have to use a lot of force to crimp these guys, so I want to slide a piece of heat shrink tube up the cable. Pretty much have to put your whole body weight into this to get this thing crimped. Alright, now even though this is a 100 amp ring terminal, uh, apparently these wires are too small for it. This is probably made for something larger than two number 10s. So I'm going to have to use the next step down, uh, which is one of these that is marked for 60 amps. This is a fairly large piece of copper, so I'm not really sure what that uh, amp number on these ring terminals has to do with that, other than maybe the amount of copper around the ring terminal itself. And as you can see, that crimp is much better. That one is not going to come off. Uh, it's unfortunate I couldn't use the larger lug, but... Uh... Alright, so with that step done, we can go ahead and put our BMS into place here. Alright, now seeing this is an aluminum connection over here, and I'm going to be attaching copper to it, first I'm going to take this wire brush and just clean around the terminal a little bit, and then apply a small amount of this OxGuard antioxidant compound. Just want a very thin amount. You don't want it like caked on. And in case I didn't mention it earlier, this is the B minus cable from the BMS that goes onto the battery. And then I have a washer, and then I have the original screw. All right, so now I'm ready to reconnect the positive here. And that was done with this aluminum uh, bus bar thing. So I'll just put that back into place. Going to put a washer on that one as well. And then one thing I forgot to put on the negative, so I'm going to have to redo it, is the uh, positive and negative for the voltage display on the front. So I'm going to put that on the positive here, and then I'll have to go back and redo the negative. So on the positive end over here, I'm going to return this bolt with a washer this time. And this is a flange nut for the bottom, so there is no washer needed. All right, so now that all the connections are in place and the bolts are tightened down, we are ready to plug in the balance lead for the BMS. I'm gonna take this temperature sensor and fish it down the side so it's above the terminal of the batteries here. And then just hold those wires in place with a little bit of hot glue. And then I'm also going to put a little bit of hot glue over these BMS leads here too, because I don't want those to come loose and rub against this bus bar over here. All right, with all that complete, we should be able to push this button here. And we see 12.6 volts. That's much healthier than what we saw when we started. And just verify the output here. 12.58 volts. All right, so we're going to try charging this with the original charger. Uh, but before we do that, uh, this cord that's on here sucks. We have a metal charger here with a steel exposed box. And the ground pin's not connected. And now we have a power cord with a ground connector. So if something shorts out to this case, we won't die. All right, so now the charger's connected. We're ready to plug this in and let it charge for a bit. I'm going to plug in my IDST uh, display here, just so I can monitor what's going on as we're charging. And here we go. And we are putting in 19.4 amps currently. Uh, so yeah, we'll just keep a close eye on this to see what's going on as it charges up. All right guys, so I charge this battery up about 90% with the original charger over there, and then I switch to the iCharger X6 so that I can connect the balance port on it. Uh, because this iCharger will balance at two amps, and this BMS is probably like 50 milliamps or so. And this is probably the fourth or fifth time I've started at this point. It's not that much out of balance. You can see cell number one was the one that was over discharged, so it is lagging a little bit behind the other three. And now you can see after it's been running for about a minute and a half to two minutes now, uh, the voltage differential is only three to four millivolts, which is near perfect. All right, so I have my standard test set up here for testing the capacities of batteries. So a typical rundown is the positive comes out and goes straight into the inverter. The negative comes out, it's going into this non-polarized breaker. It's then going through a batrium shunt, and then it's going into the inverter. The Batrium shunt is connected to a Watchmon 5 off-camera, which is transmitting data wirelessly to this Android tablet. We can see voltage, amperage, wattage. 
the capacity in amp hours and the capacity in watt hours. For the load, I'll use this Alaska brand space heater, running it on low. And this is a 300 amp hour battery. So we want to put a 0.2C load on it, which means we need to pull around 60 amps. I have a feeling this space heater is going to pull a little bit more than that, but we'll see what happens. So circuit breaker on, inverter on, and space heater is on. All right, so we seem to have settled around 957 watts, which puts this right around a 0.25C rate discharge test. So we'll let this run until either the BMS in the battery pack shuts it off or the low disconnect of the inverter shuts it down. All right, so we're at 220 amp hours currently. And looking at the BATGO display, we can see cell number one is definitely uh, discharging quicker than the other three, which indicates it has been degraded a little bit due to being undervolted. So with lithium iron phosphate, once you hit the three volt mark, it typically drops quickly. All right, so there we go. This battery tested at 247.91 amp hours before the BMS low voltage disconnect stopped our test. All right, so I consider this a successful repair. This battery is clearly degraded now because of that cell that was undervolted. The BMS shut down perfectly at 2.93 volts, and at the time it shut down, there was a 616 millivolt difference between the lowest performing cell and the highest performing cell. So I think this is still perfectly usable as a battery for backup. I certainly wouldn't do 100% depth of discharges every day, but as a backup battery, I think it's still got some useful life left. I think this is a good reminder of why we should not be buying these types of products. The build quality of this is just terrible, and the more people are buying these things, the more these businesses are going to be pumping these things out because they know there's money to be had. You'd be much better investing your money in something like this big battery 170 amp hour power block. So anyway, I'm glad I was able to get this working and return a somewhat working battery. And we also learned an important lesson here today. So if you like this video, please hit that like button down below. Any questions or comments, you can leave those as well. And thank you very much for watching.